All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our next in our series around the Equitable Access to Literacy Plan. Uh, this is for our secondary families this evening. My name is Mary Beth Harrison Cunningham. I'm the manager here at the Family Resource Center, and we are very excited to have our presenters this evening from our EAL team. And I'm going to turn it over to them. Welcome, everyone. Hello, welcome. Um, my name is Natasha Saunders, and I'm the coordinator for Secondary Language Arts. Greetings, I'm Kenyatta McNeil. I'm the middle school English language arts educational specialist. Welcome, everyone. So grateful for the opportunity to be with you tonight. My name is Tara Hewen, and I have the pleasure of serving the division as a special projects administrator for equitable access to literacy. And as we jump into our time together, it's going to be divided into two parts. The first part is we'll walk you through what we mean when we say equitable access to literacy. And then we'll also give you a preview of what is in the equitable access to literacy plan. And then Natasha and Kenyatta will share with us what we mean when we say science of reading. And also, what does that look like in Fairfax County Public Schools? And so before we jump into the what of equitable access to literacy, we want to pause to share some information around the why. So the first why is that as a school system, we have been responsive to our student outcome data. And we recognize that many students across the system have um, done well in FCPS and have learned to read and have gained the skills necessary to be um, college and career ready. And we also recognize that for many students, that is not the case. And so as a system, we want to reduce the predictability of student success based on a student's identity. And so we are really looking at our systems to improve the way that we instruct students. The second reason uh, for this major transformative change is that we want to align our instructional practices to evidence-based research. And we know that the science is clear around how to instruct students, and we want to ensure that our curriculum practices and our assessment practices and our instructional pedagogy is aligned to evidence-based instruction. And finally, another catalyst for this major change is the Virginia Literacy Act. In 2021, that legislation was passed um, and this act is, um, well, the, the ink is dry thinking about grades four through eight, and in 2021, it was for grades K to three. And at Fairfax, we are responsive to this act for grades pre-K to 12. So those three things combined have led us to creating the Fairfax County Equitable Access to Literacy Plan. Now in this plan, we recognize that literacy is the foundation upon which student success rests, that literacy is a life skill and the ability to read, write, think and discuss are arguably the most important competencies necessary for adult life. In this plan, we provide a justice centered approach to teaching and learning that will guide us over the next five years and beyond. And then finally, in Fairfax County, we believe that it's essential to provide students with explicit, systematic, and evidence-based literacy instruction. And before we share with you where we're going, we want to pause and take a moment to share with you where we've been. So this is a little bit of the journey in, in Fairfax County when we think about our uh, transformational change. So in school year 2021-22, our school board was um, committed to science-based reading instruction. And our teams quickly began to respond to that commitment, making changes in the curriculum from pre-K to second grade. During that time, we also offer professional learning. We purchase pre-K to sixth grade supplemental material. And then that is also when the Virginia legislation passed the Virginia Literacy Act. And then this school year, we've added resources using a VDOE grant. Those resources have been in the form of people 
and also uh, supplemental materials. We continue to expand our curriculum changes to include grades three through six. And then we also continue that professional development. And that professional development was for, um, is for administrators, school-based administrators and central office leaders, our leadership team, um, our reading specialists, our literacy leaders, and our teachers. And we continue to implement supplemental materials. We are preparing for a core material adoption, and we also created the five-year Equitable Access to Literacy Plan. So we're taking a look inside this plan. Um, you can check it out on the website. If you do a Google search, E-A-L-F-C-P-S, the plan will come up. And if you scroll all the way down, you'll see our purpose, our vision, and our commitments. And you'll also see desired outcomes with a five-year action plan with metrics for continuous improvement for four focus areas. And those focus areas are curriculum, instruction, and assessment, equitable and culturally responsive practices, continuous professional learning, and family and school partnerships. And we want to provide you another peek into the plan. If you go on the website, you will see this video. Now I have to say this video is uh, geared more toward elementary and it's critical to also understand that, you know, we are making this change system-wide we recognize that this is a secondary um, audience. And we also want to share with you um, this video because you'll get a better understanding of the pre-K to 12 aspect of this plan. Every night in every corner of Fairfax County, you can hear them, fathers, mothers, Grandparents, caregivers, reading to their children, creating curiosity, inviting their imagination, but most of all, inspiring them to want to learn to read. Knowing that soon they will be in our classrooms and the magic will happen. But it's not magic. It's a science, and the science of reading is something we learn more about every day. We've learned that what works for long-term success in literacy requires us to change how we teach reading in those critical early years. And we must apply what we've learned to every school and every student, because it shouldn't matter what zip code you live in, what abilities or learning differences your child has, or what language you speak at home. We believe every child has the right to learn to read. Reading is not a privilege. Every child has the right to read, and we need to be providing them that. And change is challenging in a large school division like FCPS, but our size is exactly what makes this change so exciting. Because think about how many student lives we will impact when we all do this together. In Fairfax, we believe that it is every student's uh, right to gain the ability to read and write, and it is our responsibility to guide them through that process. And I want to kick it to my colleagues to um, give you a lot, uh, overview of what we mean when we say science of reading. Thank you, Tara. So the science of reading is a body of science-based reading research that informs not only how reading and writing is learned, but also the what, content, and the most effective methods for assessing and teaching students to read and write. So it's a convergence of multiple fields of study. So we're looking at education, linguistics, psychology, and neuroscience. All of those pieces put together really help paint a better picture of reading and reading instruction and what's happening on the inside of our brains when we are learning how to read. And those fields of study have established some scientific evidence based explaining all of those different parts. And those are the things that we in secondary are learning more about. 
So oftentimes when people talk about the science of reading, there are some misconceptions. However, it, while the science of reading recognizes that learning to read doesn't happen naturally, this is not something that your brain just magically learns how to do. Our brains are not wired to learn how to read, but you may find that our brains are more wired to learn how to talk. So because that the science of reading recognizes that learning to read doesn't happen naturally and it must be taught, we do provide a focus on decoding words and understanding what they mean. And we also identify explicit instruction as an effective and efficient method for teaching reading skills. What the science reading does not do is endorse a specific literacy program or curriculum. There is no focus on just students with dyslexia or reading difficulties. We find that this, these methodologies are wonderful for most students and is not a one size fits all approach. So with the Virginia Literacy Act, it's leg literacy legislation that impacts many areas of instruction at the middle school level. The law requires professional development, curriculum alignment, new assessment guidelines, intervention requirements, and changes to the role of the reading specialist. Within the middle school English language arts arm of the secondary English language arts team, we have been taking a serious look at our current curriculum, professional learning, intervention, and assessment to ensure alignment with the legislation. We have noticed that we are in a good place and are looking forward to supporting schools with implementation. Our team is also excited about the opportunities the legislation affords us to move our current curriculum toward a more evidence-based approach. Part of our work will be in building teacher and leadership understanding of the science of reading. We plan to start with understanding Dr. Hollis Scarborough's concept of the reading rope developed in the early 1990s. The purpose of the rope was to help parents understand the various skills their children need to become proficient readers. And so in order to do that, she twisted pipe cleaners together as a model. Let's take a moment to view a brief video that explains Dr. Scarborough's concept of the reading rope. Another helpful theoretical model for the reading process is Scarborough's reading rope, which expands upon the simple view of reading. Scarborough's reading rope provides a meaningful visual representation of the process by which decoding or word recognition and language comprehension subskills are combined during skillful reading. The decoding subskills are each assigned a strand in the rope, phonological awareness, decoding and spelling and sight recognition. Under language comprehension, we need to build these reading subskills, background knowledge, vocabulary knowledge, language structures, verbal reasoning, and literacy knowledge. Think of these subskills as strands in the reading rope that become stronger and stronger the more tightly the strands are woven together. As the language comprehension subskills grow and get stronger, the reader becomes increasingly strategic in their reading. At the same time, as the reader strengthens their decoding subskills, they're becoming more automatic in their reading. With increasingly strategic and increasingly automatic reading, skilled reading occurs and the reader can comprehend text. Skilled reading appears to be effortless, but a skilled reader has fortified the subskills of the reading rope in order to manage the skills simultaneously and automatically, resulting in reading comprehension. Thank you, Tara. So currently we have a very robust curriculum that plays a vital role in developing students reading, writing, speaking, and listening skills, as well as fostering critical thinking, creativity, and effective communication. Our current curriculum encompasses literature analysis, grammar, writing instruction, vocabulary development, and oral communication. Additionally, students have opportunities to show their ability to comprehend multiple genres, build their research skills, and develop multimedia literacy. By using a concept-based curriculum, students also are provided with voice and choice in text and assessment options. 
Importantly, we are continuously building a strong connection between reading and writing through an integrated approach where students use their background knowledge and the books that they have read in order to showcase what they know in multiple writing forms. So our curriculum has several bright spots that we continue to build upon. And as with all things, we are focused on continuous improvement and have identified places where we would like to place emphasis in the coming school years to better align with evidence-based practices. Students will access Lexia Power Up through their English classes to support differentiated and personalized instruction in word study, grammar, and reading comprehension. Because we know that the research shows the power of knowledge building and intentional vocabulary instruction, we will also place a greater emphasis on these areas. Over the past few years, our teachers have used screeners and diagnostics to identify students in need of intervention. This practice will continue in the coming years while also improving our use of assessments at all stages of learning learning before, during, and after, and assessments during those times to help teachers make the best instructional decisions for their students. We know that teaching is a very nuanced and complex work. Our office is working to ensure that we provide the needed resources, professional learning, and support that is actionable and relevant. Simultaneously, we hope this presentation has given you a small glimpse into our collaborative efforts to support literacy development for our students. And with that, we'll open up the space. Um, thinking about what we shared with you, we'd love to hear what is a hope that you might have or a wondering. And Mary Beth, do you want to facilitate the Q&A section? Yes, I was just waiting. Um, so um, one participant has said, I hope my daughter continues to improve. That's, that's all we have so far. I see a participant with their hand up. Do you want to take the question in the chat or do you want them Yes, to please. Um, Susan, go ahead and put your question in the chat. Um, another participant says, the hope is to boost person-to-person -person engagement and minimizing children staring at laptops. We have quite a few people agreeing with that. I just want to echo the, um, the hopes that are already in the chat. Um, our offices across central office and our school leaders and our literacy leaders um, have the same hope and desire that you just named, that our students continue to improve no matter what their starting point is, and that we also have um, engagement from peer to peer um, when we think about our integrated reading and writing. Um, and a couple other statements from families um, looking for multi-sensory or multimodal at every age. Um, and then um, hoping um, that her child can catch up from some of the current deficits. Um, another statement is, I'm so pleased this curriculum will be in place for our children in the future. What can we do for secondary students today? Hi, Susan. Thank you so much for broaching that topic. Um, currently, our intervention curriculum is very robust within the middle school and within high school as well. We offer a range of intervention courses during the school day as elective courses where students can take. Um, most of those courses, you know, they are parent recommendations, uh, teacher recommendations, recommendations based upon their IEP that can support students who currently are not reading on grade level. Okay, I think that's all we have for now.
thank you for your question, Melanie. Um, do we see word parts at the secondary level as a tool for supporting the science of reading? Absolutely. Um, Kenyatta, along with other teachers, are working this summer to beef up that part of our curriculum um, to ensure that all students get um, instruction in morphology or word parts, um, as, as you mentioned. And we're also looking in the future to develop a more interdisciplinary approach to teaching um, word parts so that students in the secondary can see how that works across all content areas. The next question, are secondary teachers getting OG training? Um, that actually is something I'm going to kick over to one of my colleagues, Carrie Liesma, and I'll let her I'll respond to that. Absolutely, we are. Um, we have been training in Norton Gillingham since 2020. Um, we recently have a new vendor. And so um, we have a large amount of teachers getting trained this spring and we will continue training teachers throughout next school year pending school board budget approval. Um, it is going to be a key piece of our intervention offerings for especially for our students who have deficits in word recognition. Um, and it's something I, I love everyone. <laughs> I'm our OG trainer, so I love to talk OG, train OG, do OG. And I realized I didn't answer the question of secondary. You can tell it's the end of a long week. So um, that training is not just limited to our middle school. Um, with our schools using their ESSER funds, they have the ability to train teachers um, in their buildings using their ESSER funds. And then this summer and continuing into next year, we are providing training through teachers grades K through 12. And our goal is to ensure that every school has at least one teacher who is trained and able to provide Orton Gillingham. Are there any other questions or wonderings from our participants today? So um, we have another question. Um, do you see this as a big shift in the current secondary English classroom? I think in FCPS, there are spaces, um, classrooms where many of these things have been happening for some time. And then in other classrooms, um, this will be considered um, a shift in instructional practice. The bigger shift in FCPS is just an alignment and ensuring for continuity across content across classrooms so that they can support all students. So is this a shift? Yes. And yes, we also have the capacity to make this shift because of the pre prerequisite knowledge and understanding that we have um, been building in our classrooms and with our teachers. So we do have a, another question about, you know, um, students and, and, and not reading on grade level. Um, son's about to graduate, still not at grade level. Um, do you have advice for helping him to continue to learn? I think one of the key things about understanding his grade level reading is trying to figure out like what does he what might be getting in the way from grade level reading sometimes it could be something very simple and sometimes it could be something a little more complex 
Um, but that's one of the things that could definitely support in continuing to help him learn to read and to continue the love of reading past 12th grade um, is really getting down to, well, what might be getting in the way? I also want to just put this um, in the space is that reading is something that we're always currently getting better at. Um, we read more and we develop more background knowledge and more vocabulary knowledge, and therefore we can continue to learn how to read or continue to get better at reading. And I'm gonna also kick it over to Carrie and Tara um, and Kenyatta if there was something else they'd like to add. The only thing I will add is, you know, uh, whenever a parent is concerned about their students reading, you know, one, I think we said this last week, Tara, you are your child's most important and sometimes uh, biggest and sometimes only advocate. And so never feel, um, be worried about speaking up when you have a concern. And so at the high school level, um, it may look a little bit different than navigating the elementary, but reaching out to, if the school has a reading specialist, if not to the MTSS team. And sometimes if you're like, I have no idea what those terms mean, reaching out to your child's counselor or assistant um, principal and, and voice that concern. And so what we have at our schools are these MTSS teams where a group of professionals um, gather and they look at data and they determine, you know, what are areas of strength, what are areas of concerns, and what are possible next steps. And so I would say that would be really important. Request additional testing. And I, I think in my former role, I was the dyslexia specialist. So I, I think these are recommendations I uh, made similarly before. So, you know, the Lexile is an assessment, and I saw that as a question um, before, that gives us kind of a composite of where a student is reading, but it doesn't really give us data as far as when we look at that Scarborough's rope in those um, domain areas are what are possible strengths and weaknesses. So asking the school to do some follow-up assessments with um, getting to decoding specifically, getting to language comprehension. And the, that really, those are the assessments that'll best guide the school in providing the most appropriate intervention. Um, and so, did I leave anything out, Kenyatta? No, I was, I was looking, I was typing an answer, but I would just say that, um, again, emphasize it doesn't give any discrete skills, but it's, it was originally used as a measure to match students with text, with books. So just to have an idea of what levels of text the students would be able to access. That was the original purpose of it, was to match um, students with text. And I think the other question was, how does it compare to other, hey, other, to assessments? other assessments? Yeah, so to other assessments, um, we use the reading inventory, um, or you might hear referred to as the RI and Lexile scores are a normed measure. So in terms of, although it doesn't give us any discrete skills as compared to say like a diagnostic test, it would give us um, more information. So it, it's just, you know, what it's used for is a screener versus a diagnostic that would give us specific information about a tool that will be used, a specific program, such as Lexi, you're having a placement test. So that that's the difference. So, so another parent is asking, and I think this is, I bet we have a lot of families that, that might be concerned. So, you know, a child has an IEP, definitely has issues with reading, um, but maybe the, so here the IEP team is saying that the Lexile is fine, but the, the, the parent sees that he really is still struggling. Um, is, is there some advice that maybe you could give this parent or just how could she talk with her IEP team, have, have this conversation? I think, yeah, this is a, that's a good question. I think using multiple measures to 
to demonstrate either proficiency or possible weakness in reading is really important. And so when I say multiple measures, I'm uh, the main, when we look at assessment, the main dimensions we're usually looking at is like a fluency measure. And so that's what the student reading out loud and looking at how many words per minute they're reading and their accuracy. Um, that is really important as a reading measure because it lets us know um, in order to be able to comprehend what we read, we have to read fast enough that our brain can automatically like pick up the words and that our brain has this cognitive space to, to think about what the text says. And so an, a measure like an oral reading fluency at grade level really lets us know, is the student automatic or are they spending a little bit more time um, decoding um, and, and pulling the words off of the page? From that place, so looking at the, the results of an oral reading fluency, then we can dig a little bit deeper, either going into looking at decoding assessments. And so decoding assessments like phonics inventories have students reading words in isolation and pseudo words. And that's really important, especially for students who have, um, who compensate. So they're able to decode because they're using the context of the sentence or the meaning to figure out what they're reading. And when we ask students to read words in isolation and pseudo words, that lets us know, is there an underlying decoding issue? Um, assessments of phonological awareness are also a great uh, tool to see if there are underlying issues. That's that really foundational piece. If there's a struggle with foundation, uh, phonemic awareness, we know that there's gonna be struggle throughout. Now on the flip side, I talked a little bit about word recognition. When we look at language comprehension, that's the, uh, other side of the rope. And so that's when we do measures that get to um, vocabulary. Um, sometimes for some of our students, when we really wanna dig in, is there a comprehension issue? Um, we will provide text uh, read orally and ask questions that way to get at is the language comprehension. But all of those are measures that um, are going to help the school team better address or diagnose kind of what's going on. At the very least, you can ask for a QRI, qualitative reading inventory, right, Kenyatta? We were just talking about this, um, which kind of gets at all of those pieces. Yeah. And I think most secondary schools have. I think, thank, yeah. thank you for that. Um, Carrie, um, and, and the mom that you are addressing, I do appreciate her comment. Um, um, and, and, I and I will share, and this is some of the questions that we often get at the Family Resource Center, is just having kind of the word and the understanding to be able to go in and have a conversation with the IEP team is really important to our families. So thank you all for helping our families that are on tonight find those words. Um, because and, and have understanding of, of some of those tests and scores, because I, I, I know that, that, you know, with knowledge comes, you know, that power and that opportunity to, to really collaborate with, with their team. So really, I, I think our families really appreciate that. Um, what other questions might any of you have um, for our team? As you're thinking about that, um, we did put in the chat for you, um, certainly how to contact us at the Family Resource Center. Um, you know, we, we have, um, can talk with you about that and certainly um, work with you um, and, um, you know, how you might talk with your IEP team moving forward um, and would have, be able to get, find you some of the resources that you might be looking for as well. Um, all right, um, so, um, so, so this is really around, um, I guess, a testing situation that um, her, her child had. So in previous assessments, the, the, the tester reported that their child needed a lot of encouragement and support to the test. While I appreciate the support, I wonder if this could result in a form of compensation that isn't showing his true needs. I, I could take a stab at this one. Yeah, thanks, um, thank Tara. You, 
thanks everyone for uh, the questions. Um, I'm thinking we could take one of these questions and create a whole hour presentation around them. So, you know, we're giving you our first pass and, and they deserve some, some thinking because they are, they are complex. Um, I would, I would also say as a take off my FCPS hat and put my parent hat on just for a moment. Um, I uh, am a mom of a student who has difficulty um, reading. And I recognize that compensation question that you ask, that's a real, that's a real thing. Now, Carrie talked about this a little bit when we think about the reading rope and we're not necessarily thinking about behaviors, but behavior is also tied into that, that sometimes our student might be, our students might be really strong in one or more areas that causes them to overcompensate and almost mask difficulties that they might be having in other areas. So for my son, his background knowledge, strong. Vocabulary, amazing. And his decoding was, you know, not, not nearly as strong. And so for years, he was overcompensating and masking his reading difficulty until he couldn't mask it anymore. So um, I appreciate that, that question around sometimes uh, students might be um, overcompensating in one area and that causes us to miss some of the reading difficulties that they might be having. That's a great point and I'm glad you put that mom hat on Tara and I will somewhat too. I think the other thing that I realized like reading is beyond it's something that we do to function every day, but it's um, it's so intrinsically linked to our intelligence, right? And usually about second grade is when kids kind of realize everyone else is getting it and, I, and I'm not. And so that's when we start to see kids acting out like either behavior or internally, like getting sick, not wanting to go to school. And so this is one of those secrets that they're trying to hide from everyone. And so they may, it may be something like they are having a hard time opening up even to the examiner because they are embarrassed and they feel that, you know, people are going to judge them. And so sometimes I know when I've done examining, that's part of it is like building that rapport, like this is safe, whatever, you know, what we're going to find out, we're going to find out how I can best teach you and, you know, things like that. So I know, um, you know, I, I would just bring those concerns up and, and it's something to definitely be noted. Like there's no perfect testing environment. Anytime we bring two people into an environment, we're going to um, affect the outcome. But knowing that and, you know, as a parent, like going in saying, hey, I want you to do your best. This test is going to give us information to help you um, may help. But, you know, I've worked, we've all here worked with many, many kids and um, like I said, it's very personal and it, it you know, I, I really appreciate that and the bravery of our kids to come to school, you know, after you've struggled. I always tell parents, you struggle with something for years and years and years. Um, and someone asks you to go do it in front of everyone. I mean, that is really tough. And so just honoring that and, and figuring out where we can meet kids so that we can best support them. So another question around um, resources for writing good IEP goals, um, especially for older students. Um, I don't know if Carrie, you want to take a stab at that? I can. Um, you know, I would say it, a good goal should be based on the most recent testing not just uh, diagnostic, but educational, psychological, like looking at all of those pieces and how the student has responded to instruction in the past. Um, and then really looking, where is that breakdown as far as comprehension? One, I would say the first thing is making, ruling out a decoding and fluency issue. So if we're addressing comprehension, we need to know that that student is reading um, decoding and they're reading at a rate that they're able to access the text for comprehension. If those two things are in place, 
Then looking at, we know the biggest areas that impact comprehension are vocabulary, background knowledge, literary knowledge, um, and to a certain extent, reading strategies. And so a good goal would really drill down into those individual areas so that we are targeting them to ensure that the student is making progress. Um, Nyota, Tara, Natasha. Um, I was just going to say that the goal also needs to be matched with the instruction the student is receiving. So um, it goes back to those, you know, multi-tiered systems of support and really, again, putting on my parent hat, having whoever you're speaking to be very specific because just saying that a student needed a lot of support is not giving you any specific information as to what that actually looks like. So um, I would just ask about the instruction, how the goal um, is being measured um, so you will have some information so you can ask about those types of things. If you feel like the goal is not um, specific to your, to your child and seems vague in general, then I would ask about how's this goal being measured? What is the instruction um, to ensure that my child is growing in this area and that the goal is actually a good match? Thank you. I think that all that makes such great sense. And, and certainly, you know, Jenna, know that if you wanted to reach out to us um, at the Family Resource Center, we, we could sit down with you after your, maybe even after your IEP meeting. And if you have concerns about a goal, we, we can talk about that as well. So um, people are here to, su to support, um, but thank you for those. Any other questions for our team? All right. Well, Tara, Kenyatta, and Natasha, thank you so much uh, for this wonderful overview tonight and, and really for your, for your in-depth responses to the questions. I think that was very helpful to the families that are with us here tonight. Um, and we wanna thank everyone for joining us. Um, please do reach out if you need other supports or have other questions. And um, we thank you all for joining us this evening.